Welcome to Keeping the World Company on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Jay Fidel. Today, we're going to talk about Zelensky and whether Zelensky and Ukraine are getting enough support to conduct their defense and what will happen after the election in the U.S. Our co-host for the show is Tim Apicella. Our guests for the show are Manfred Hedigson, Emeritus Professor of Political Philosophy at UH Manoa, and Jean Rosenfeld, an independent scholar who joins us by Zoom from Berlin. Welcome to you all. Okay, let's let's start with you, Manfred. Uh, what's the status of the war? How is it going? How is Zelensky and Ukraine doing these days, two years after they were attacked? On the one hand, it looks uh, all right. On the other hand, it doesn't. And um, I mean, on the on the battlefield, the Ukraine. Ukrainian military holds on to sections of Korsk, but uh, the Russians uh, are advancing at great losses. Uh, I mean, the losses of the Russian uh, military are extraordinary. Uh, but uh, whether the North Korean troops that are coming in will change that, I don't know. But when you go to the political um, Scene you have, you have on the one hand uh, a really a coordinated support for the Ukraine. There was a meeting in Berlin recently of uh, the five Scandinavian countries: Denmark, Norway, Sweden, Finland, and Iceland. Uh, they celebrated uh, the twenty fifth anniversary of the the embassy complex in Berlin. And the speeches that the foreign ministers, presidents, and sometimes uh, the crown princes or princes, princes, princesses gave, uh, they're all motivated by the fear of what Putin has done in the Ukraine. So you have solidarity there. But then you have this very interesting intervention a few days ago by the, uh, by the Russian um, by the Russians asking the German ambassador to come to, to the foreign ministry in Moscow um, to receive the protest of the Russians for the Germans having stocked up uh, the East, the, the Baltic Sea, uh, Harbor Rostock as a NATO base. And uh, the German ambassador, as well as the government in Berlin, denied that. Now, Rostock has been a harbor in the G during the GDR period. I was there in July. It's a, a big uh, harbor for the Baltic Sea. You have to remember, the Baltic Sea is now almost exclusively surrounded by NATO member states. There are only two parts where you have Russian harbors. Uh, it's St. Petersburg and uh, you have uh, Kaliningrad, the former Königsberg. Those are the two harbors that uh, belong to Russia. All the rest of the Baltic Sea is now NATO country. Um, and that certainly has made NATO a much more formidable force. And they are supporting the Ukraine. Uh, you had two days ago a meeting of the German and the British uh, foreign minister, no, you know, defense minister in London, and they uh, declared a closer cooperation between the two militaries, the German and the and the British, and they were both in strong support of uh, the Ukraine. Now the guy, the German uh, defense minister Pistorius is uh, treated in the German media and the public as a possible successor for Scholz, uh, because the poll numbers for Scholz are really in the cellar. Uh, they're very bad. Now, there is one, I think, important detail that one has to also pay attention to. The Russian intervention has uh, created uh, 
critique of uh, the German government by the new Wagenknecht party. Now, uh, Sarah Wagenknecht uh, is a very charismatic, youngish uh, politician who started the party early this year and gave the party her name. And she uh, is a Russian, is a Putin friend. She was uh, a communist uh, in East Germany and uh, a member of the left party. She left that party. Uh, but what uh, she represents is a layer of not only Putin-friendly people uh, in Germany, uh, primarily in the East, but also to some extent in the West, but she represents also an anti-American uh, dimension in the German public because uh, for you know the, the United States uh, was not since uh, the race riots in, in the 60s and the Vietnam War and the Iraq War, uh, not liked by the German <clears throat> uh, left. And she uh, represents that resentment of American uh, presence, you know, and she is absolutely against the stationing of nuclear missiles in Germany uh, at this point. Okay. Uh, Dean, you're in you're in Berlin. You've been traveling in Eastern Europe. I'm sure you've been thinking about and thus talking about uh, the American position and the support of Ukraine. Uh, what have you seen? What have you heard? I have seen more than I have heard, but most importantly, I've heard what what I get a sense of is that the life in these formerly occupied territories, East Germany, Poland, and Lithuania. Uh, looks <clears throat> very good on the surface. People are thriving. There is a lot of um, movimiento, as we say, in California. There's a lot of stuff going on, and there are young families and, and people out and about, and they look very contented. However, when we sat with a couple that my son knows very well, an older couple, um, they were expressed in East Germany. They were expressing concern about the future, uncertainty, uh, discontent with the government, particularly Schultz's government. Um, these are not people who are uh, extreme on either end, either left or right. So they they are saying that uh, she works for an NGO that helps senior citizens and is unsure as to whether or not the government will continue to fund them sufficiently. He was saying he doesn't know what the economic conditions are going to be, so they're being very frugal with their retirement income and saving money for the future. Uh, they're not happy necessarily with the government. And the, this this tells me that in general, people are less content than they appear to be on the surface. There's this kind of unease, this sense of unease. And then in a, a young girl in a cafe that we were going to every morning for our coffee uh, in Poland was uh, commiserating with us about, and she, she was commiserating with us about uh, our fear of what's going to happen here. And we were saying, yeah, it's a little bit worse than you've got there in Poland, because in Poland, they had had a previous right wing, radical right wing government, but now they're back to the moderate again. Uh, so in general, I would say that things are less uh, rosy than they seem on the surface, although you would think that people would be very happy uh, to be independent again, and they are actually, particularly in Lithuania, there's a great sense of joy and uh, and and activity and beauty in Vilnius, uh, Lithuania, and it's a it's a beautiful city. It's it's a very um, it's a young person's city. It's things are going on. We did visit, however, the former KGB headquarters, where it's now a dedicated museum to the occupation and the resist, resistance movement that went on for decades in Lithuania. Not It started with the Germans, but then it went on through uh, the whole communist uh, era. 
and and was uh, a really tough in the KGB headquarters museum outside there were signs supporting Ukraine uh, we went to the von C um, house uh, uh, conference house where the final solution was worked out by the Germans um, Reich in 1942 and there were uh, there was an appeal to there in the museum at the end of the exhibitions to help the Ukrainians. And uh, so there is a strong sense of we must help the Ukrainians because I think people who have suffered through occupations know that it could happen again. And they're, they're really bordering uh, Russia and, and they're very fearful. So um, there is this sense of unease, even though people are thriving economically and socially. So th there is something going on in the world that seems um, almost um, sinister, uh, like we're, we're facing an un a very, very uncertain future. And I get the sense of it in Europe as well as the United States. The, the overall impact of this trip in visiting these sites of occupations and resistance and the 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 von C villa where uh the final solution was was worked out and and to uh the places in Poland also uh we went to Gross Rosen concentration camp a one that's not as often visited as Auschwitz we were uh, advised to go there by uh, a man who wrote a book on two men that 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 worked there and and did some remarkable things uh that were there were prisoners but they worked with with prisoners and and it was um being there just packs a punch it's like it's like this the civil war here almost happened yesterday well it's like world war ii almost happened yesterday but in these countries particularly germany people are making sure that it is remembered we saw Everywhere we went, we saw school children visiting. Uh, this morning, we were at the Von C, uh house, and there was a uh, lecture going on uh, in French with a bunch of, uh, of people. It was like a seminar. So there, there is an attempt to teach uh, the past here uh, as it is not taught in the United States, unfortunately. Also very impactful was visiting Dresden because um, there are signs still of the burning uh, of, of Dresden. When they rebuilt uh, the great cathedral, they utilized some of the charred bricks and, and stones that were from the original cathedral. And there is a portion that is standing there from the original cathedral. And so, the, there, there is a sense the, of of the past being recent, and I think with current politics, a fear again that the the curtains are going to close on some of these parts of the country. So I think this is the genesis of the resistance to Russia and what is going on, and the solidarity with Ukraine. There was a city bus in Vilnius that had on the front of it not its destination, but briefly it had I heart. Ukraine, and you would see um, um, signs of free Ukraine um, all over the place in in Poland and in Polish and, and Lithuanian. So it it has been a very interesting trip so far. Okay, Jean, we're gonna we're gonna say farewell because of the um, issues with your connection, um, but we'll catch up with you next week for more. Okay, Tim, let's move to you. Uh, I want to go back to the original question, and that is, how's the war going? I think it's going rather difficult. <clears throat> There's mass casualties on all sides. And um, financially, I think Zelensky is worried. Uh, obviously, it comes down to an election in the next 13 days. Uh, I think that the... The freedom of his country depends on who's going to be our next president, our 47th president. And I'm sure he's not sleeping well at night. 
uh, Zelensky. Um, some spot of good news is that uh, some funds have been recently approved by the G7. Um, I think there is uh, over $300 billion of Russian assets that were frozen. And as of a couple of days ago, I think um, they have approved a loan in the amount of $50 billion for Ukraine. Um, obviously, there's the idea that there's $250 billion left over. Uh, how that's going to be decided upon is anyone's guess. I, I don't think the war is going well. And I think at some point, this war of attrition needs to be ended. And I don't know how, what that looks like. If, according to Donald Trump, he's going to settle that, uh, settle the war and, and, and get a ceasefire and end the war within days of his uh, inauguration. I, I find that hard to believe. And uh, I think if there is a, an end of the war and Donald Trump has a say in it, it'll look like complete surrender to Russia. And uh, I, I just don't think that that's an acceptable solution. Um, other than that, um, dismal is my word, dismal. Yeah, well, you know, it's it's funny that we now uh, have, we've had a burst of news about uh, the, this loan that Janet Yellen uh, organized. <clears throat> um, and, um, you know, the possibility of other support. Um, but we, we have also this very real, you know, brick wall barrier in less than two weeks. And uh, if Trump wins this and takes over as a matter of foreign policy, uh, he is going to surrender Ukraine. Anything that's not there already will have no effect, I think, um, because it's too. There's no time. There's no time to spend that money, buy weapons, ammunition, and the like, uh, train people to use it, put it on the battlefield. It's theoretical at best. It's uh, it's academic. Um, because in two weeks' time, we'll have, you know, we may very well have Trump who will surrender the whole thing. So uh, there's a certain futility here. Uh, when I ask you, you know, what support have we provided? Are we providing? Will we provide? It is all totally dependent on this election. And uh, do you agree with me that if, if Trump wins, um, all of this is completely futile? Let's acknowledge that since February 24th, 2022, the United States has contributed $64.1 billion to uh, support Ukraine in its efforts to repel Russia. Uh, that's a lot of money. And I would suspect that most of that has been delivered in the last two years. Well, two point, you know, two plus years. But I agree with you that this loan in the, in the amount of 50 billion uh, won't have much effect if, if Donald Trump becomes president. He'll, he'll, he'll try to uh, pull the purse strings immediately on Ukraine and saying it's, for the, it's the good of Ukraine that this war not continue, and I'm doing it to, to help Ukraine, even though Ukraine doesn't know that it's going to help them. We know that Donald Trump has great admiration for Vladimir Putin, and that has been known since the day he became president, or even before. And... Um, Again, I could see Donald Trump helping uh, old Vlad to get back his $250 billion left or $300 billion. Um, I'm sure want, Russia wants that money back right now, and it's been frozen. And these are just a few things that I think will happen immediately uh, should Donald Trump become president. Uh, I, I agree with you that, uh, you know, if, if Trump is elected, then it's not going to look good, and, and we'll see we'll see a loss occur rather quickly. Yeah, you, you mentioned that we, the United States, have provided um, the federal war 60, 60 billion plus, um, but we've never provided um, boots on the ground as North Korea has. Well, nor has should Putin we. Has... Okay, but uh, we haven't. We haven't. Uh, and Putin has provided boots on the ground for various other places within his uh, his influence. The other thing is that the sixty billion. Okay, I'll accept that, but I will add to it that that's not what Zelensky was asking for. The number would be entirely different if we were talking about the amount of money, weapons, what have you. Short of boots on the ground, no boots on the ground. Um, if the United States had provided what 
um, Zelensky's been asking for. It would be much more than that. So yes, 60 billion, but I suggest there are some people who would say that's short. Well, and I'll add to that to say that what Zelensky wanted and needed was early on in the conflict, uh, things that were not only defensive weapons, but could strike back offensively. Uh, it's like putting someone in the pool with their hands tied behind their back. Yeah, they could tread water, uh, but how for how long? And we all know that you know Zelensky early on asked for F-18s. Uh, they asked for long-range missiles. They asked for tanks, Abram tanks. Uh, a lot of those things were denied because, and, and I get to a certain degree where President Biden was worried about an acceleration uh, into a, a, a greater war. And certainly Vladimir Putin was uh, saber rattling about uh, tactical nuclear weapons being used. And so there was that, I think Biden's attempt to balance uh, what he provided to Ukraine would not agitate excessively Vladimir Putin, um, which is, I think, a faulty way of looking at it. But uh, nevertheless, that's what's that's what's happened. This country has had issues in Congress um, in the course of our division, if you want to call it that. There's a lot of people who have either opposed helping Ukraine or are increasingly opposed to helping Ukraine. Uh, and would vote for somebody who didn't want to help Ukraine. And this is known to the world. It's known to NATO. It's known to everyone. Um, so query, have we provided adequate support, in your opinion? In order to avoid a full-fledged World War III, I'd say almost. How's that for a okay. non-committal answer? That's non-committal. Um, there are people who would feel that we had not done that, and there are people who would feel that um, NATO hasn't done that. Um, Manfred, I want to go to you for a minute. You know, recently Zelensky said that the solution to all of this um, is that um, is is if NATO would bring him in as a member. Now that's a long shot. Everybody agrees that's a long shot, but there's a number of NATO countries that would do that. They would bring Zelensky and Ukraine in. The one that's holding it up, are you ready for this? Are you sitting down? The one that's holding it up is the United States. The United States is not willing to support making Zelensky and Ukraine members of NATO. I find that's interesting because um, this is NATO and it's far away. Why should the United States take that position when other countries in NATO would be willing. Your thoughts, Manfred? Look, one cor correction or a question. I'm not a legal scholar, but uh, both of you say when Trump becomes elected, the support for the Ukraine stops. He will not be acting president when he becomes elected. So he, Biden is still in office legally for, I think, two months after the election until Trump becomes sworn in. So uh, Biden has the power, uh, even if uh, you know he loses it in in January when Trump becomes sworn in. So I do, I'm not, I mean, I have not the legal answer for that. But I think both of you have gone a little bit too far in uh, saying you know once uh, he becomes elected, it means the end. Now you have to, you forgot, both of you forgot also that uh, you have a lot of support from uh, the EU for the Ukraine. Germany is the second largest supporter financially and also, also militarily of uh, the Ukraine. And uh, all of the meetings that you have had in Berlin, you know, the Scandinavian countries, Macron. Why, well, do you agree with Tim that Ukraine is losing this war? No, if Germany, I, if Germany is so supportive, why is Ukraine losing the war? It's not losing the war. It's a difficult situation that it finds itself in. I don't think it is losing it at this point. Uh, so it's not. Um, I mean, it's a kind of a defeated statement uh, to make. So I do not. Well, so it's a, Manfred, it's a war of attrition. Yeah, and uh, you know, Russia yes. is playing that card. Uh, and he's doing every hybrid thing he can do, including propaganda, including hacking, including social media in this country to change public opinion. He's yes, doing I everything know. he can to undermine yes. Ukraine. Look, and he's taking territory back. 
Yes, he's actually, lot- as we speak, he's taking territory back. But so, lot- uh, at best, it's a stalemate. I don't think it is a stalemate. It's My a- question to you is, can't we collectively do better? We've done yes. a lot of talking, but we yes. haven't actually helped yes. them. And you have, somehow you forget that the attrition is not simply a Ukrainian phenomenon. It's a Russian phenomenon. You mean the, the hundreds of thousands of casualties? Uh, that uh, Putin has to deal with. I mean, killed and wounded, 500,000 wounded people, 200,000 uh, killed. I mean, so that the, has- The difference, Manfred, is that he could stop the war and stop the, the loss of, of, of uh, soldiers. But, if he um, but he doesn't war, do that. He keeps if, getting new soldiers. If he now, stops, Ukraine doesn't have that option. If he stops the war, that's the end of his regime. Uh, because uh, you know the invasion in 2022, you know that was, uh, in a way, his declaration of uh, Russia becoming this dominant imperial power again, as it has been during the Soviet period, and then in, in Peter's and other Tsarist parts. So he cannot. He has to go on. Oh, I'm I'm not sure I agree with that, Manfred. And the reason I say that is that he's very good at at changing the subject. He's very good, like Trump, at making propaganda, at finding an excuse. And the excuse would be that, um, well, um, if the United States made him do this or somebody else made him do this, and he really wants to go ahead and take over uh, Eastern Europe, but uh, he can't do it because he's being blocked by someone else. And so, you know, I mean, there's a million ways he could escape the, the notoriety of stopping the war, but he doesn't do that. He hasn't done that at all. He he pushes on. He continues the murder. He continues the invasion. Um, and he doesn't look like he's stopping, even if he has to bring in foreign troops. The characterization of his ego is uh, not unlike the characterization of Trump's ego. And you have to, in, in that regard, you know, you have to uh, really do a psychology of uh, Putin, why he doesn't. So it has. It, 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 he has invested so much of his uh, egomania in making Russia an imperial power again. I mean, when you're looking at the BRICS meeting today in Kazan, um, he wants to uh, become. I mean, he will not have all of these countries becoming part of this new empire. But what he is doing there with the support of Xi to some extent, with the support of the Indian prime minister and uh, all the other, I don't know whether the Brazilian uh, president is there or not. I haven't seen a picture of him. No, he, he, was, uh, he was injured. He didn't show up. The South African uh, president, I think, is there. Uh, so you have um, not B, but you have um, R, I, G, S being present. But uh, I mean, it's a very fragile show of power uh, because the Indian prime minister, you know, plays as much with uh, Russia as it plays as he plays with uh, the United States, um, and the same would apply for Brazil. So for that reason, you know, I, I, I he has invested so much. In this vision, you know, of a well, great... look, look at the Ukrainians. The Ukrainians have invested far more. The Ukrainians have a destroyed country. Um, no, no, they, invested... they, the, the percentage of their people have been killed. It's much greater than in Russia. And no, the no, percentage and... of their infrastructure has been destroyed. The flood, uh, the, the power plants. I mean, they, they're a ruined nation. It's going to cost hundreds of billions, trillions yes. to right. fix up the damage he's done. So I, I'm not uh, sympathetic to him um, about the, the loss of face here. The question, the question really is, have we done enough to keep them alive? Uh, Ukraine has had a lot of um, desertions. It has, uh, it has uh, lost many aspects of its fighting force. It doesn't have the guns, ammunition. It doesn't have the ability you know, to, 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 to fire back, if you will, into Russia. 
And so, um, you know, have we done what we could do? I, I keep seeing all these people say, oh, yeah, we support them. But the support is, has not been helpful. For two years, they have been, you know, reduced to rubble by Russia. Uh, couldn't we have done better, Manfred? Well, the question is whether they should have received these uh, missiles in to order to, to bombard, uh, to bombard uh, targets in Russia itself. I mean, the course, the course uh, interlude that started early this year was an attempt, you know, to, uh, in a way, of a, was an encounter attack, but uh, it, it stopped, it stalled. Uh, and I don't know whether it would have been uh, an acceptable, acceptable policy to provide them with these long-range missiles to bombard uh, to St. Petersburg, Moscow, and, and other places. I mean, in a way, doing what the Russians do in, in Ukraine. But there is hesitation, you know, within NATO countries to go ahead with that. You know, the fears of a nuclear war is there. I mean, even though I do not think he will launch. Well, he's played us. He I mean, it reminds us. me of a, of a caricature of a chicken making chicken sounds. Uh, you know, why, why, do we, why do we jump three feet in the air every time he rattles a saber? Uh, we, we should know him better than that. And so I think what we, you know, he's, he's good at scaring us. And the result is we have been scared. Um, from any real effort uh, to defend Ukraine, even with Iron Dome kinds of defensive systems, we haven't really provided enough to protect them, uh, to say nothing about uh, attack them. So, Tim, let me go to you for a minute. Um, have we provided enough? Will we, however we set it up, whatever the politics, whatever the politics in Europe, will we be able to save Ukraine? Uh, and I really appreciate what Jean was saying about the superficial uh, euphoria that's going on in Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania. And I have friends, uh, if I didn't tell you, who just got back from a trip to those places, had the same reaction. But under the hood, Eastern Europe is scared. And we should be scared. And Poland especially should be scared. Um, have we protected them? Well, uh, based on my conversations with from some Poles when I was in Italy, no, not nearly enough. And they are worried. They are worried. And these aren't uh, older, um, the older generation that remembers uh, Russia occupied, you know, occupation. This is uh, from pretty young people. And uh, they've learned from their parents and their grandparents that Russia is not to be trusted. And uh, the only thing I can say is that they are a member of NATO, and uh, the fifth article, Article Five, would kick in should Russia even think about going into Poland. So that's that's the only saving grace for for the Poles is to remember Article Five. Mm -hmm. But is have we given them enough? No. Have we should have given them more uh, early on? Yes. Why didn't we? Um, again, Biden's concerned about uh, accelerating this into a wider World War Three war. Uh, or the use of technical nukes. Um, just to put things in perspective, if I may, uh, the Vietnam War, 58,000 uh, US troops were killed in action. Uh, World War II, that number is somewhere around 291,000. So I agree with Manford. Uh, the, I think the numbers right now for Russian loss alone in the two years since the invasion of Ukraine stands around 200,000 dead, killed in action. Um, Think about how Russia is processing 200,000 dead of its own citizens. And I'm sure, like the Chetnian um, incursion, uh, those, those that were killed in action that were Russian soldiers had a great impact on the mothers of Russia. Uh, in fact, it was the mothers of Russia that actually spoke out very, very uh, uh, in a strong force. Have we seen any impact like that? We're not getting we any seen news. We're not getting any news from Russia on that on that on that avenue. Not, none whatsoever. We were earlier on, but now you say the war, you call it a war in Russia, and you are off to to the camps. You're 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 jailed. Uh, you can't even say that it's a war. So, uh, like all good di dictators, uh, they clamp down on information. 
they um, jail people immediately if there's one uh, iota or hint of dissension or criticism. And uh, gosh, what's that sound like? That might be on our horizon if Trump is president of the United States and to Manfred's point, not elected. Well, Manfred, you know, how important is this? Uh, how important is support for Ukraine? Can Ukraine do it without us? No. It, sometimes Ukraine is very creative. I mean, they, they can yes. make drones, they can find good strategies and all that. Um, it, does, does the uh, support from the West, from Europe and from the US make that much of a difference? Can they survive without us? No. No, I think they need the support. But I mean, the contempt of Putin and Russia, of, of Putin's Russia is extraordinary. I mean, I mentioned to you uh, this toilet paper roll that I bought in, in Kiev, you know, uh, with a picture of Putin on it. That represented the attitude, you know, of the Ukrainian civil society uh, since 2014. And then, uh, you know, I was there in 2017 when I found that, kissed my ass or uh, what, licked my ass, whatever that meant, the Russian, I couldn't get an agree agreeable translation from people, uh, what the message on the toilet paper really meant. I mean, I saw the picture, that was enough. I still have it. I cherish it, you know, as a, a memento. But I don't you don't use it, Manfred. Don't use it. No, no, I don't use it. I I use it as a I use it as a, as a symbol, you know, of <laughs> Ukrainian contempt uh, for Putin, you know. And having seen, you know, Ukrainian civil society, you know, from Lemberg to Kiev to Odessa, was really an extraordinary uh, experience, you know, for that. And I do not think even if they have become battered, you know, uh, by Russia, that that has gone away. It's still there, you know. So in that sense, I find it uh, encouraging, you know, what happened in Berlin when the five uh, Scandinavian uh, foreign ministers were uh, saying, you know, we all have to support Ukraine. And the same happened with Biden, Macron, uh, Fama, and, and Scholz when they met in Berlin. Uh, I mean, that was Biden's last European trip. So in that sense, I think the support has not uh, left, but there's also this anxiety. You have to remember uh, that uh, <laughs> the, the left in Germany, their anti-American attitude has to do with memories of Iraq and, uh, you know, Vietnam. And they feel, you know, that uh, maybe America is driving uh, NATO into a war that uh, will mean... Really well, has, hasn't there been a dynamic on that, Manfred? You know, no, at, at one point, two years ago, Europe and Germany seemed to be 100% in favor of defending Ukraine. Now, as you have discussed, that's simply not the case. Well, I think in Germany, the support for the Ukraine um, is very, very strong in the on the conservative side, you know, the Christian Democratic Party, Angela Merkel's uh, party, and uh, within the Social Democrat and the Greens, strangely enough. I mean, they are very, very forceful supporters of support for Ukraine. Then you have radical left and the radical right, AFD and the Wagenknecht party, you know, who some think they are both supported financially by Putin. For the AFD, some people it's true. For the Wagenknecht party, it, I don't know uh, whether that can be certified. But in any case, you have these resentments on the radical left and the radical right. But basically, I would say the support for the Ukraine, uh, the closer you come to the Baltic Sea, uh, I mean, it, it certainly is less intense in Spain, Portugal, uh, southern France, and Italy. But uh, in the heartlands, I mean, the, the eastern heartlands of the EU and NATO, it's very, very strong, the support. In the last uh, year, 
we have seen support for Israel right. diminish, diminish in Europe, right. notably. And, and, and that is at least in substantial part, that is um, support, friendliness, you know, connection, affinity with the United States. So isn't there a connection there somewhere? If I give you a country or a continent that is, uh, you know, that is that is not supporting Israel um, and in the process not supporting the United States on that war front, um, I think I could also give you a country or a continent that's not supporting the United States in its wish to defend Ukraine, don't you think? Look, Germany is next to the US, the strongest supporter for, of the Ukraine. Could you answer and my question? And Israel as well. I mean, Germany is sending weapons to Israel apart from money. So uh, when in, in, in that regard, you know, the, the connection be between Germany and the United States is very, very strong. It faces some opposition, especially with the you know, behavior of Israel in uh, the Gaza Strip and uh, in, in bombing, you know, Beirut. Uh, whatever well, we don't want to talk about that today. Maybe we should talk. No, about no. But I would like to ask you this: As Germany performed on the promises and assurances that it has made over the past two and a half years to help yes. Ukraine, yes, yes, it has. and the two in money million, and money and weapons, yes. and two million refugees are living in Germany today. N no, no, I'm Ukraine. talking about money and weapons. But, but it's yes, it has. Tim, I'm concerned about uh, about you. You know, Zelensky. Zelensky is uh, not a professional politician. Or at least he wasn't. He was a um, he was a, an actor, if not a comedian, on television in Ukraine. Um, and somehow he, uh, you know, acceded to um, the job of being the president, and he's done a good job. But I collect um, photos uh, of him and um, in various uh, situations uh, over the past two years. And I would say those photos make him look pretty tired. So I ask you a, a, a two-part question. One is, the war of attrition affects him, doesn't it? And he must be getting tired, don't you think? And the second is, without him, forgetting about you know support from elsewhere, without him, can they continue to fight? Or if he is unable to lead them, will that be the end of it? Oh, really great questions. Uh, yeah, he's tired. Um, he wouldn't. Uh, look at me. I, look, look at photos from me six years ago before Trump was president. Look at photos of me now. Uh, I've aged exponentially. <laughs> Trump has lived in my brain rent free for seven years. OK, so yeah, uh, Zelensky's more than tired. He's worn out. But he, he's determined and he perseveres. I mean, he's, he's an incredible human being. And to answer your other question, uh, what would happen if Zelensky was no longer the leader of Ukraine? I, I think there would be some serious issues, but the will to, to fight and repel Russia is greater than one man. And although uh, no one could you know, say that uh, Zelensky has a, the greatest orator and, and, and salesman, to ask for resources of uh, both of the EU and the United States, he's been remarkable. He was almost right. like a Nelson Mandela as far as his persuasive skills and, and, and charismatic abilities. Uh, so it's been amazing. Uh, if, he, if he were to not be president of the Ukraine any further, would that be the end of Ukraine? I, I don't believe it would be. Post okay, Green Tim, Eternal. how about your closing? How about your closing? My closing is, you know, before we get to any kind of negotiations or off in the distance, uh, one, the election has to be settled. Who will be president of the United States? Because that will have a direct bearing on, on, on the conflict in Ukraine. I'm sorry, I keep calling it a conflict. The invasion of Ukraine by Putin, Putin's war. Two is, uh, even, even if Kamala Harris is elected president, uh, peace is far off in the distance because until the United States, until Europe gets tough on those countries that are circumventing the, the Russian sanctions, we continue on. Russia will only know pain when everyone says, we're not gonna do business with you. And that means oil revenue, that means everything. So uh, like, you know, like Chamberlain and, and like the, um, you know, the embargoes we had in, of past and 
you know, before World War II and in, in countries since then, uh, embargo, embargoes and, and sanctions are only as good as everyone's playing and cooperating with those sanctions. And that's not happening right now, and it hasn't happened for really since the sanctions went in. I mean, maybe a lot of them were adhered to, but most of them haven't been. So that's, that's my final point. Until the sanctions uh, are start being enforced and, and enforced very strictly, uh, this will continue. Well, wow, you know, your comments uh, really hit me. And they prove again that all these things are connected. Everything we talk about, all these historical threads, all these events around the world, they're all connected. Ukraine is just one expression of that connection. Thank you so much, Manfred Henningsen. Uh, thank you, Tim, Tim Epichella, for this discussion. Aloha. Aloha. Aloha.